Hey everyone, this is Lomi, and in this house we love Zelda games. Zelda was one of the first things I ever played, and I have so many good memories of popping that gold cartridge into my parents' NES and losing myself in the adventure for hours on end. I've played and beaten all but one or two of the handheld games, so it only made sense that if I ever branched out from making my own book characters into dolls, this would be the direction I went. I would be hard pressed to pick a favorite Zelda game, but my favorite version of Link is definitely the one from Twilight Princess. This project actually started about two years ago, when I was first thinking it might be nice to look into 3D printing with resin for doll creation. I started this project on my FDM printer, and when I wasn't looking forward to the amount of finishing work the prints would take, someone very sweet reached out to me on Instagram and offered to help by resin printing my head sculpt for me. She sent two heads, so one can be converted to a sleeping head later if I so choose, and before I show you how the print turned out, this is the model I made. I had originally hoped to find a sculpt of Twilight Princess Link that I could just convert to a BJD, but there wasn't anything out there that was a high enough quality for me to use, and the game models themselves don't actually have heads, just faces. So I sculpted this in Blender and happened to be playing through Twilight Princess again, so I could easily load the game and get all the references I needed. And here's the printed head, wrapped in cotton to protect his ears. This was my first time seeing a resin printed doll and I was super impressed. Since this was only my second finished doll head, I wasn't feeling ambitious enough to sculpt my own body. We decided to print one that was available on Thingiverse and shrink it down from one third to one fourth scale. My printer also took it upon herself to find the Twilight Princess version of the Master Sword and send it along as an extra gift, which was incredibly thoughtful. As I mentioned before, this was my first time seeing a printed head and I was so impressed by how smooth the print was. The details really blew me away and made me certain that I'd want to get a resin printer of my own at some point. But that was enough time spent admiring the project ahead of me. I decided to start with something easy, which was the eyes. Using game assets as a reference, I drew some iris options in different shapes, sizes, and colors so I could test and see what I liked the best. His eyes in-game are the more oval anime style, but I felt like the round ones might suit a doll better. Also, in-game, Link's eyes are actually a very dark gray and not the blue we're used to seeing, and I thought punching up the saturation to be a more traditionally Link blue would look good, even if it's not completely accurate. I printed my eye chips on photo paper and tried them in the doll. Ultimately, I did find that I liked the brighter blue round eyes better than what actually matches the game, so that was the first of the creative liberties I took. After that, I started his wig, using material from a pair of nylon stockings. This goes on the doll's head over a piece of plastic wrap, and then the whole thing gets covered with several thick coats of white glue. It took a few days of painting it on and letting the glue dry to get the wig cap hard enough. After it dried, I cut it down to the size the wig needed to be and started gluing on the hair. For this, I used some dark blonde alpaca fiber and just applied it in thin layers. You can see that at first it's pretty choppy and rough looking, but after most of the wig is done and I'm just waiting for the wefts I made for the part to dry, I use thinning shears and snip in vertically to blend the edges of the layers and make it look more natural. I like using thinning shears for this because it gives a more randomized look than using plain scissors. If you're interested in wig making techniques though, I have a lot more videos already up that address the wig making process in depth. After everything is trimmed, I glue on the wefts for the top part. Since these would be the most visible part of the hair, I used the natural tips of the alpaca locks. Most of his hair goes under his hat anyway, so this is the only part that's going to be visible all the time. While the last of the wigs glue dried, I got started with clothing. And you can really tell this was a project I began a long time ago because when I started, I didn't even have my current sewing machine. I got that along the way. I started with his pants, since they would be easiest, using a basic pattern I'd already created that's available in my pattern archive if anyone needs it. 
These were made with a simple tan cotton finished with a snap and the fit was pretty much perfect. After that though, I needed his shirt. I started with the high collared white shirt he wears under his tunic since I was determined to use proper layers for his outfit. I drafted the pattern for measurements and tested it a few times to make sure it would be a good fit before I went on to make it in the super thin jersey knit fabric of the final version. Like with all the other patterns I make, this also was put up in my pattern archive, so if you look for the turtleneck pattern and tunic pattern made for one quarter scale dolls, you can make your own link outfit too. The next layer of his outfit was the chainmail. I spent a lot of time looking for resources for actual chainmail, but his size made it difficult, and I ultimately decided to use some gray sport netting material. This was made using the same pattern I'd drawn for the tunic. Since the sleeves and the bottom of the tunic wouldn't need to be hemmed, it would let the chainmail be a bit longer than the tunic, so it would show. I used the selvage for the bottom edge so it would have a nice finish, but I think the cut edges of the sleeves look fine too. Lastly for the outfit came his green tunic. In order to make this as similar to the character design as possible, I made seam binding for the edges and the sides of the tunic are actually open. A small detail that's not noticeable most of the time, but I really like how it looks once it's on the doll. The hems for the sleeves got rolled to the outside and neatly topstitched in order to fake the seam binding and make it a little less bulky. The bottoms of the sleeves are sewn shut and I finished the edges with a zigzag stitch to make sure it would be sturdy and last for a long time. Then it was finally time to graduate to my new computerized sewing machine. Link's signature hat was actually the first thing I made on that machine. I sewed a band on first, then closed the hat and finished the edge with a zigzag stitch. There were a few embroidered details to add to his hat and sleeves, and I thought I'd recorded those, but apparently not. At that point, it was time to focus on his accessories. I used my Ender 3 to print bracers from Thingiverse. I didn't have any brown filament on hand, so I used beige and just painted them. However, I left the inside bare, because I figured if I needed to use glue, it wouldn't stick to something that had paint inside. Then, while I had the paint out, it was time to paint his face. I actually didn't do any surface prep on this print at all. It was smooth enough that I was able to paint it without doing anything special which shows how great a job she did in printing this for me. I used gouache paints for the line work and tried to keep the styling as similar to how he looks in the game as possible. It took a few tries to get things looking the way I wanted, but the water-soluble gouache made it easy to wipe and redo anything that was necessary. I added more depth to the face with peach and pink tones of blushing, with a bit of purple around the eyes, browns and peaches on his lips, and golds and browns for his eyebrows. Overall, I think his face up was only three or four layers, mostly due to how simple the line work around his eyes ended up being. Out of everything I did for the doll, I think the face up was the most fun. 
Also, just as an aside, it's actually really funny for me to watch this and see the clear before and after divide in the quality of my favorite hoodie, comparing the cuffs to how they looked before we got a puppy and how they look afterward. Huskies, y'all. Training her is no joke. It's okay, though. I've got a replacement hoodie waiting for after we're through the biting phase. After the face up, painting the sword and shield was next up. I start with spray paint, using my favorite Rust-Oleum automotive primer and then some basic silver, also from Rust-Oleum. I'll add color to these using Vallejo acrylic paints. You'll see I ended up printing a shield to go with the sword and scabbard, and that was actually one of the first things I did when I got my Elegoo Saturn. But you might notice this isn't the shield from Twilight Princess, it's the version found in Breath of the Wild. The main reason for that was when I was looking for Hylian shields to print, none of the Twilight Princess ones available were what I would consider cosplay quality, and were instead more of flat display pieces. This one has a handle on the back so I can tie it to the doll's arm, and it also had a lot of depth and was curved to look like a proper shield. I honestly wanted to make a shaped Twilight Princess shield for this, but I didn't think I'd have time, and while I'd been fitting work on this doll in a little at a time between other projects, it reached a point where I became absolutely determined that I would get Link some kind of finished before Tears of the Kingdom came out, because I knew I'd immediately want to start making outfits from that game as well. So while it's not completely accurate, it's the best option I had for right now, and eventually I'll make a more accurate shield, or else find a better shaped version of the more ornate Twilight Princess shield at some point in the future. The Hylian shield's changes since Ocarina of Time have been pretty small, and the core elements pretty much stay the same, so it's an inaccuracy I'll tolerate for now, just for the sake of having the project finished. Just for reference, the blue paint only takes one coat, but the gold needed two to be able to cover properly. Metallic acrylics are just notoriously bad, so I'm not surprised. At the time I bought paints, they were out of red in the Vallejo, so I used Martha Stewart craft acrylics for the red part of the shield. Like the Vallejo Blue, it easily covers in one coat, and continues to be my favorite kind of craft paint. The last little detail on the Master Sword is the lacing on the hilt, which in Twilight Princess is a deep shade of green. I didn't have a good quality green, so I put the paint on super thick in hopes it would cover with one coat, and it did. Once all the acrylics were dry, I gave them a coat of Liquitex gloss varnish and moved on to belts. The first belt I made was the one that goes around Link's waist, and I used a strip of real leather I'd saved from somewhere, probably a thrift store, along with some super tiny brass buckles. I ended up kind of hating the leather because it was so thick it was almost impossible to get it through that buckle and I fought it forever. 
So when it was time to do the shoulder strap for a scabbard, I switched to vinyl. It doesn't look as nice and won't last as long as the recycled leather, but it's much easier to work with. Link's shoulder strap in the character design has the belt going through a two-layered pad, but I didn't have a good way to replicate that. So I took a small artistic liberty in having the thinner belt go through a slit in the shoulder pad so it would lay on top. I felt like this looked a lot better. I figured super glue would be strong enough to hold a belt buckle on this part, but the second piece of the strap that goes around his side would get pulled on a lot more. So I ended up making that one by sewing a loop at either end of the strap so it would be nice and sturdy. Then it was time to make his bags, and around this point I kind of had a crafting revelation where I realized not everything I make has to be functional 100% of the time. It was kind of empowering to realize that there was no crafting police that was going to come after me if his bags didn't work. And since I'd been having a lot of trouble with paint in my hands, I decided to use hot glue and just make non-functional bags out of scrap vinyl instead of trying to sew functional ones. There's no reason I can't go back and make different ones later if I find some materials I like for it. Anything I do now can be touched up or redone, and I'm already planning to redo the shield at some point in the future, so why not? I made the bags with straps on the back to thread them onto his belt, and used little brads to simulate some kind of fastener. Following that revelation that I didn't necessarily have to follow rules of functionality, I decided the best way to handle his gloves was just to paint them onto his hands. I grabbed some brown craft paint and just painted on fingerless gloves instead of trying to sew tiny fingerless gloves out of some ridiculously stiff material. The piece under Link's bracers is dark blue, so I made some little partial sleeves out of navy blue jersey knit fabric. I figure I can glue these to the inside of the bracers, but I want to make sure it fits nicely, so I put them on Link's arms first. I used tweezers to help me get his white sleeve in through the blue one, then put his hands back on. Since his sleeves are now stretched out as big as they need to be, I can wrap them with ribbon to be the straps for the bracers and glue that in place. This way I can remove these, but be sure they'll fit back on. Then I used hot glue to attach the bracer to the sleeve. Even though I was using low temp glue, it was enough to warp one of the bracers a little bit, so I'll probably add those to my list of things to remake. I can print some in resin later and they'll probably hold up better. I had a pair of brown boots that worked well enough for this doll, so I didn't have to make those. And that meant, after two years of working on him a bit at a time, my link was finally done and it felt great. I took him right outside for photos on my back patio, where our love of Zelda games shines through. Really, could there be a more perfect place to photograph him? At the end of everything, one of my favorite details is the embroidered lacing on the sleeves of his tunic, but overall I'm in love with how the stall came together. When I took him out for photos, I realized I hadn't planned any way to connect the scabbard to his shoulder strap, so it's tied on with brown ribbon for now, and I'll come up with something more permanent later on. So I made it. Link is done before I get my hands on Tears of the Kingdom, if barely. Now he has a home on the video game shelf in the living room, along with all our Zelda games, and I am ready to disappear for the next week or two while Hyrule calls my name yet again. And that's all for today though. Thanks for watching. Bye.